Good morning, everyone. My name is Rui Hagman. Hello and welcome to this Jim Das Jim Desai webinar on um, groundwater model complexity. Today, we've got uh, John Doherty and Catherine Moore speaking again. By now, everyone should probably be familiar with the two of them. Catherine is, amongst other things, a senior groundwater modeler at GNS in New Zealand. And John, of course, everyone knows as the developer of PEST, amongst other things. Both are co-authors on the Simple is Beautiful question, uh, sorry, paper. And today they're going to be addressing the concepts of uh, groundwater model complexity and how that plays into decision support modeling. Before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll address them at the end of the talk. Uh, feel free to use the chat box for general conversation and uh, chit chat. Apart from that, we can get started. Uh, we'll be starting the talk with John today. And unless John or Kath have anything else to say at the moment, I'll hand over the presentation to John and then we will stop our videos. Control is yours, John. Okay, so I'm hoping everyone sees my screen at the moment. Um, so, uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. And um, so this is the second of our two webinars, the first on uncertainty. And I think this particular webinar addresses probably one of the most important things uh, in groundwater modeling, uh, the issue of model complexity. I think this is something that we often get wrong. There is an allure when we're building decision support groundwater models uh, to make them very complex. The idea being that the more complex we make them, the more they'll look like the real thing. Uh, there is a problem here that uh, we really don't have much of an idea of what the real thing looks like. And for reasons that we'll talk about as we go on in this webinar, I think that getting more and more co complex often actually defeats the purpose of what groundwater decision support modeling is all about. So if we are going to talk about appropriate complexity in decision support modeling, we really have to start off by saying, what's the purpose of decision support modeling? That means we've got to get our job statement right. So as we'll talk about during this webinar, we're going to present not a formula for how complex a model should be in any particular set of circumstances. Rather, we're going to present some concepts and, and a way of thinking that'll allow modelers to be able to choose an appropriate level of complexity for their own decision support circumstances based on a set of concepts that I think are a little bit more sound than trying to do a digital replica of what happens under the ground. If that's why we're modeling, we're getting it wrong, I think. That's where we start going terribly wrong. Because our job as decision support groundwater models is, is not to replicate what happens under the ground. Firstly, we can't do it anyway. The, the earth is infinitely more complex than our feeble attempts to simulate can convey. And secondly, that's not our job. That's putting the cart before the horse. As we tried to explain in, in our last webinar, our job as decision support modelers is to quantify, is to, is to help people manage a groundwater system. And we do that using simulation as an agent, not because we can actually replicate on a computer what happens under the ground. We do that because Simulation allows us to process data. But firstly, let's recognize what our job statement is, because if we're going to build a set of concepts that can take us to an appropriate understanding of how complex or simple a model should be, we've got to know why we're doing it. We've got to have metrics for which we can judge the worth of the decisions we make. And there's one thing for sure, that metric should never be some kind of digital representation of what happens under the ground because we can't do it. So as we talked about last time, as decision support modelers, our task is to help management. And what is management? Management is all about 
allowing us to make decisions of how to handle infinitely complex environmental systems in ways that stop things from going wrong. Now, wrong is, of course, context specific. It's mining or irrigation support or, or if we're looking at, uh, at contaminant transport, there's always a management problem. There's always something we want to avoid. And we're undertaking modelling in order to help decision makers avoid those things. And as we talked about last time, that means that this whole modelling thing is all about taking data wherever it exists, assimilating that data and making predictions of what will happen in the future, not under any idea that we can make those predictions with certainty, but knowing full well that we are incapable of making those predictions about whether something will go wrong or not with certainty, because there's not enough information to be certain about what will happen in the future. However, there is enough information to reduce the uncertainties of decisions that matter. And that is why we do decision support modelling. And simulation is part of that whole process. Simulation, the model, is used in conjunction with something like PEST or PEST++ to quantify the uncertainties of decision critical predictions and to reduce those uncertainties. And when a model is used in partnership with software like PEST or PEST++, for reasons we talked about last time, we do have that ability to take some information from data that resides here and there and in other places, data of very different kinds, mix it all together, extract the information and point that information at the decision critical predictions that support management of an environmental system. Now, once again, that is our job statement. Any metrics that we apply to an appropriate level of model complexity must be drawn from that job statement they must not be drawn from some futile comparison between the pictures that we have on our screen of the model, any resemblance that it bears to the real thing. And certainly we should not judge our model by someone, us or someone else saying, ah, yes, that looks like the real thing, because that is not the metrics by which we, we live. That are not the metrics by which our work should be judged. That is not the reason for our miserable existence as modelers. So, dispelling myths. I'm just being a little bit negative here before I hand over to Kath to get a little bit more positive. Let's get over the fact that we can or we should even try to simulate what happens under the ground very well because we can't. And if we try too hard to do so, it probably won't serve the decision and support imperatives to which we are trying to adhere as we model. And, and let me just say, you know, another few words about this idea that we can simulate very well what happens under the ground. So we get a simulator like Modflow. And Modflow gives us uh, little bits and pieces of digital Lego in the form of boundary conditions and cells and a limited number of layers. Just a moment's reflection says the idea that this can ever look too much like that, it's beyond our reach. Now that doesn't mean we should get all depressed. It, in fact, we can, for reasons we talked about last time, do a pretty good job of assimilating information quantifying and reducing the uncertainties of decision critical predictions if we design the modeling process for that purpose. That's the purpose we model to assimilate data, quantify and reduce uncertainty. And we said last time that that imperative is immediately going to have repercussions for how we build the model. We said that you know, if we base our model on hydrogeological concepts, as we should, geologists will tell us the detail matters, but they can't tell us what the detail is. So the idea that we can actually hardwire into a model 
structures that represent detail is actually futile because the detail may be important, we don't know what it is, so it has to be represented stochastically, which means that we got to have parameters, which Kath will talk more about soon, that do our stochastic work. Parameters are the things that have to vary. Parameters have to be endowed with continuously variable variables so that they values so that they can adjust during history matching and they can adjust during uncertainty quantification. And for reasons we talked about last time, that means that our model, our groundwater model, is going to be somewhat, well, a lot abstract, limited number of layers, lots of parameters to do the stochastic work for us so that we can quantify and reduce the uncertainties of decisions that matter. So abstraction is built in to our goals as decision support modelers. And before I hand over to Kath, just a, a couple more words about complex models. And any of us who have tried to build complex models you know, know from experience how painful it is. Know from experience how many moving parts they have. And we know from experience how numerically sick they can be and how they can take a long time to run and how their ability to work with software like PEST and PEST++ is limited. But those of us who who, who want to try to build complex models because we've signed up to what we think reviewers will want, some kind of representation, digital representation of what happens under the ground. And as we add more and more complexity and try to replicate more and more processes under some unstated premise that the asymptote of ever more digital complexity is actually reality, we all know that it doesn't work. We all know that the asymptote of ever increasing model complexity is just a giant headache. And we all know that we end up creating this giant beast of a model of which we're none too proud, but we hope that we can get out the door and the client will pay for it before he or she realizes what they're paying for. Those of us who have built these complex heffalumps know that they don't work. So having gone along this negative route, I am now going to hand over to Kath to be a little bit more positive, to rewind, start again, and take us along a path that we can develop some concepts that will allow us to look at complexity in light of the metrics to which we should have signed up for when we've signed up to build a decision support groundwater model. So over to you, Kath. Last webinar, and also John just now, uh, we discussed the critical role that parameters play in carrying and conveying information from data to predictions and how a model structure contains these parameters. Armed with those concepts and others that we're about to introduce, we now turn our attention to what we mean by model complexity, which as we'll show is not a one-dimensional phenomenon. We also discussed how our parameters are upscaled or averaged representations of our varying hydraulic properties and the connectedness between these properties. These parameters are fixed in location but can take on continuous values which allows them to be maximally flexible. The parameters are accompanied by a joint probability distribution where the prior of this distribution expresses our expert knowledge and this can then morph into a posterior distribution through history matching. Multiple history matched realizations of upscale parameters are used within the model to make predictions which are then collated into probability distributions, as you can see here on the bottom right. So the models are essentially embodying the stochastic nature of the model. We now look at how those parameters are placed within a model structure. The pragmatic reality of the decision support model requires that we adopt a fixed model structure that doesn't need to be altered for every possible subsurface heterogeneity. Ideally, anything that we're unsure of should be represented by our adjustable parameters rather than with a changing model structure. But how many parameters do we need? Too few and we get poor fits to our data because we can't introduce the heterogeneity required to fit that data. We also risk not representing the heterogeneity that matters to our prediction, leading to an underestimate of uncertainty. On the other hand, too many parameters have their problems too. 
we need a parameterization that's reasonably complex, but not to the extent that we are overwhelmed with stochastic detail so that we can't even see what the data is trying to tell us. There's also tension in how complex our model, model structure should be. It can't be too simple because it needs to provide for sufficient parameters to fit the data and represent the heterogeneity that matters for our prediction. On the other hand, too complex a structure and we run into trouble with long model runtimes and numerical instability. It's also important to note that a more complex structure requires more parameters to complement that structure. But paradoxically, there's a tendency to use less parameters to simplify the history matching process in a numerically challenged complex model, thereby evading our stochastic responsibilities. So we can see that both structure and parameterization can be simple or complex. A model can have a simple structure but a complex parameterization or a complex structure and a simple parameterization. If we're going to come up with a useful conceptualization of an appropriate model complexity, we must take account of these two interacting aspects of a model design. Now let's come back to our job statement as decision support modelers, which is to quantify and reduce the uncertainties of decision critical predictions. What reduces uncertainty? Information does. So our job as decision support modelers is to build models that robustly quantify uncertainty, facilitate the flow of information to reduce that uncertainty. We have various sources of information in our groundwater model. We have site conceptualization information and a description of groundwater flow processes, which allow us to build a numerical model structure populated with parameters. Combining this model within a associated prior parameter probability distribution allows us to describe the prior uncertainty of a prediction. And then we also have measurements of historical system behavior, which allow us to reduce the uncertainty of our predictions further. It's helpful to consider the parameters as the receptacles for all of this information that can be then channeled to our prediction. So it's our parameters that are the foundation of decision support model design. Now we'll look more closely at how we can talk about parameters. We use a term parameters space, which is a mathematical concept that we can think of as the collection of parameters that feature in our decision support model. We can use the mathematical process of singular value decomposition to divide this parameter space into parameter combinations that we can estimate uniquely and those that we cannot. Parameter combinations that we can estimate uniquely fall into the solution space, that's what calibration is giving us, and parameter combinations that data doesn't inform at all reside in the null space. We can use the mathematical process of singular value decomposition to divide this parameter space into parameter combinations that we can estimate uniquely and those that we cannot. The solution space is defined on the basis of information that flows from historical field measurements to that space and informs us of average or broad scale hydraulic properties. Whereas the null space only can receive information from expert knowledge and site characterization data. And this information is necessarily stochastic. It's telling us the details that matter, but it can't give us the specifics of those details. Um, unfortunately, the solution space null space split is awkward. Any single parameter can reside partly on one side and partly on the other of this parameter space split. And it can be shown mathematically that any simplification in model design should maintain the integrity of the location of the parameter solution space boundary as this eliminates any predictive bias. So why does this flow of information and in singular value decomposition matter? It matters because it gives us the basis for a model design framework. In the spirit of starting from the problem and working backwards, we can develop a model design roadmap that's paved in logic that can create a path along which information can flow to its destination of decision critical predictions. We're able to define different prediction contexts and thereby design models that work best in these contexts. And that gives us the ability to design decision support models that are in accordance with our job description. The ability to do this rests on the concepts that we've just been talking about in ways that we'll now discuss. And fundamental to this is recognizing the distinction between parameter and structural complexity. And as you can see, those terms feature in our middle column. 
So let's get into details, starting with predictions that are sensitive to parameter combinations that are in the solution space. Recall that these solution space predictions are sensitive to parameters that are informed by historical behaviour of the system, but aren't sensitive to parameters that are in the null space, that is those combinations of parameters that aren't informed by historical behaviour. This generally occurs where the data is of a similar nature and is collected under a similar stress regime as the prediction we're making. The model needs to be sufficiently complex to assimilate information in that data, but no more than that. A common example of this are models that managers use to set allocation limits in areas with good, good historical pumping and climate records and a well-instrumented aquifer. So the past is a good analogue for the future. The model will have been trained or calibrated to replicate the aquifer's historical response and be designed with sufficient parameters to be able to do this. So this is similar to machine learning. In this category, our forecast is best served by replicating the immediate past. So our model design strategy for solution space dependent predictions emphasizes history matching. The model needs to be stable and run fast so it can be run many times. It needs enough structural complexity to carry sufficient parameters to fit the data well, but that's all it takes. We can ignore the null space. Black box or machine learning models can still serve this prediction data category well, but physically Based models are still useful because they provide us with tailor-made parameter receptacles for history matching. We need to be a bit careful where we're moving into uncharted territory like climate change, for example, because there may be other parameters in the null space that become important and, and should be represented in our model. And when this happens, we're actually moving to another prediction data category. So going back to our roadmap, we can see that we're on the bottom lane. Our job is solely to fit the data well, and this history matching process sits somewhere between physically based modeling and machine learning. We need a moderate level of both structural and parameter complexity to do this well. At the other end of the spectrum are predictions which depend on parameter combinations that are almost entirely in the null space. In the last webinar, we discussed how just because we have a calibration data set doesn't mean that this data informs the parameters that the prediction is dependent on. So null-based predictions occur either because we have no data or the data we have isn't relevant to the prediction we're making. For example, in our Uncertainty 101 webinar, we showed that head measurements tell us very little about contaminant movement or with coal seam gas extraction, because we're subjecting our system to large vertical gradients that haven't occurred before, this means our vertical conductance parameters won't be informed by historical measurements, and instead we have to depend on expert knowledge. We can deal with this situation in two ways. We can go structurally complex, or we can go structurally very simple. We can go complex, because in these circumstances, we're off the hook in terms of history matching because data isn't informing our prediction. So we can give full stochastic voice to our expert knowledge when using modern day geostatistics. And there are a variety of methods that can be used, some of which are listed here. Using these methods, we can run the model with many geostatistical realizations of the subsurface and collate the predictions to build up a histogram that represents the prediction probability distribution. And in this case, the prior prediction probability distribution can be used as a surrogate for the posterior because the data doesn't inform the prediction to any great extent. However, this doesn't mean that history matching has no place in this category. The structure of the model and the parameter distributions we use still need to have integrity. So by comparing historical observations with model outputs, which have been derived from our prior parameter distribution, we can check that there's no contradiction between the data and our system conceptualization. We don't have to fit exactly, but we can use this process to make sure the model doesn't violate the past. We may decide to throw away very poor matches, as those blue lines show, and thereby undertake a primitive form of rejection sampling. And then we run our prediction model with each plausible realization and collate a prediction probability distribution. Okay, back to our roadmap. We can see 
both our parameterization and our model structural complexity is high using this geostatistical lane. We haven't denoted this as our preferred option for this type of prediction because while geostatistics help us understand the influence of the subsurface structure on groundwater flow and transport, we can't rely on it to give us an absolutely realistic prior. Typically, the Earth is far more complicated than even the most complex geostatistical model. For example, we may need to consider how weathering or faults in their damage zones or structural unconformities may affect the connectedness of permeability. So we can go to a lot of trouble and still not bracket the true prediction with our probability distribution. There is an alternative. The fact that uncertainty in this predictive context is high makes the modelling process a little more forgiving. We may be able to use a structurally simple model and achieve a similar outcome. This is a worst case model. It can still be based on geostatistical concepts, but it's a lot less work. For example, if we pump in this complex geological medium, the question may be, what is impact over here? And when we ask that question, we're normally only concerned with the pessimistic end of the prediction probability distribution. That is, is it possible that we cross an undesirable drawdown threshold if we pump over there? We're actually not concerned with the rest of the probability distribution. We only need to know whether it's possible that this threshold is breached or perhaps if we're risk averse, is it remotely possible that this threshold is breached? This worst case model still has to represent geological knowledge and the repercussions of that knowledge on the prediction we're making. But we can do this in abstract ways using simple and fast models, which still retain integrity as worst case simulators. For example, it's the connected permeability that will affect this particular worst case prediction. We can show this possibility of connected permeability using a simple model that shows a pathway of connected permeability in an abstract way. The upscale permeabilities that we assign to this simple pathway can be informed by previous geostatistical studies that have been used to derive the probabilities of distance versus connectedness in our upscale parameters. But we shouldn't calibrate this model as our parameters will be too coarse. So back to our roadmap. Clearly this worst case method is cheaper than full geostatistically based methods. They may even give us a better guarantee that the right answer lies within our probability distribution. All that is required is a simple model structure and a simple parameterization. There will be uncertainty introduced by the simplification of the null space, but if we can reject the hypothesis that a bad thing will occur with the simplified model with demonstrably conservative uncertainty limits, then it is rejected. One important rule in this context is do not history match. The parameter receptacles for information are too coarse and in this situation, history matching will almost certainly induce parameter and predictive bias, thereby doing more harm than good. So now I hand over to John to discuss the predictions which are neither solution or null space dependent, but lie somewhere in between. So unfortunately, this is a situation in which as decision support modelers, we find ourselves most often. So this is a situation in which maybe we've invested a fair bit in gathering data. Data about you know, properties of the system that uh, we're going to try and manage. Data about the behavior of the system through measurements of system state. Now that information, that data we've gathered has a lot of information. We can't turn our back on that. But we're going to do something different to this system, different from what it's ever experienced before in many cases. So the prediction which we make, it's going to have a lot of uncertainty because the data which we have doesn't inform us of the properties which are going to come into play when we start messing around with that system. So we've got data, we've got information, information which we need to assimilate to reduce uncertainties, but we don't have enough information for that uncertainty to necessarily be very low. We've got data of two very different types from many different locations, which it is our job to assimilate. And this is where things start to get difficult. It's mixing of the 
stuff that we can infer from the historical behavior of the system and the stochastic information that we gain from site characterization. This is where Bayes equation rules, this is where decision support modeling has to be done as a servant of Bayes equation. So we've got to make an important prediction. And uh, that prediction will be partly solution space dependent, partly null space dependent. It's going to have uncertainty. We have the data that can reduce that uncertainty. And that is our task in doing decision support modeling in a variety of complex environmental systems. So before we go on to analyzing what we should do there, I just make the point that um, Living in a highly parameterized world is now mandatory. So in the old days, we people talked about parameter parsimony. That is right off the table. We need to have a lot of parameters now. There's data out there. There's information out there. And our job is to get at that information through data assimilation. And our model has to be built in a way that we provide, as Catherine said, the receptacles for that information in our model, those precious, precious parameters, the reason that we're building this model. And that's the thing, we're building the model for the parameters. The structure is there to hold the parameters. The structure is not why we're building the model. The structure, which supposedly gives this model the magical qualities of looking like the real thing, whatever the real thing is. The structure is there to hold the parameters. The parameters are the things that receive information. The parameters are the things that direct information. It's all about parameters and we need lots of them. We need lots of them so that we can, the history matching process can respond with heterogeneity where it needs to be if that's what the data says. And just as importantly, we don't want to put heterogeneity where the data doesn't give any support for it. And that's what will happen if we don't have enough parameters. And also just as importantly, it's the parameters we can't estimate that are just as important as those we can. And our job as decision support modelers is to quantify the ramifications of not having enough information. We need to quantify uncertainty. We need to live in a highly parameterized world. And another thing, the more structure we decide to put in this model, the more structural complexity, the more we need to have parameterization complexity to complement it. Having a complex structure and a simple parameterization scheme in this decision support context where we're drawing on information from solution and null spaces doesn't make sense. In this context, more structural complexity means even more parameterization complexity. This is the world in which we live in if we're going to adhere to the decision support imperatives of quantifying and reducing the uncertainties of decision critical predictions. Now there's a spectrum here. There's a spectrum here which says, well, how much structural complexity do we have? Now, as Catherine said, we've got two times of types of complexity to look at here. Structural complexity, parameterization complexity. They're not independent. They, they are related and they're especially related when we're in this particularly difficult decision support modeling context. Now, should we have a small, uh, not small, we can never have small structural complexity, but just moderate structural complexity, or should we have high levels of structural complexity? Now, it is a spectrum and I'm not going to say for one moment that we should always go to one end of that spectrum because it's a spectrum and how we respond to our own decision support context will put us on a different place on that spectrum. But to illustrate perhaps the repercussions of the existence of this spectrum, it is a little bit helpful to visit either end of it just to analyze what we get from more or less structural complexity. So. Let's go to the structurally complex end of this spectrum first. Now, I have to say that this is the end to which we are, as modelers are often drawn, perhaps not out of common sense, but out of fear. This is the end to which we're often drawn because we're constantly wondering whether if our model doesn't look like, quote unquote, the real thing, whatever the real thing is, 
unless our model doesn't look like a figment of geological imagination, then reviewers or someone else is going to say, this can't be a model of what's under the ground. It doesn't look like what's under the ground, as if anybody knows for sure what's under the ground. And there, once again, there, this allure of looking like the real thing often leads us to places which don't actually support the decision support imperative at all. So, and, and let's not forget that yes, detail matters, but we don't know the detail, so we have to represent the detail in a more, more abstract way. Hardwiring in detail, hardwiring in structural detail so that it looks quote unquote like the real thing, for reasons that which I'll explain, can often actually be a giant step backward for mankind when it comes to decision support modelling. Nevertheless, this is the end to which we are often drawn. Now, sometimes, of course, we have to be structurally complex. It is a spectrum after all. But let me just illustrate with a few pictures about some of the pitfalls of migrating too easily to this end of the spectrum. <clears throat> And it is a sad thing, I think, that in the world we live in at the moment, the onus of proof seems to be more often on those who want simplicity rather than those who want complexity, structural complexity that is, when really it should be the other way around. So just to illustrate some of the pitfalls of, of migrating too quickly to that structurally complex end of the decision support spectrum, let's pretend that uh, this is reality here. We've got a well here that's pumping and we're wondering what effect that's going to have on this river here. And let's pretend we have a few drawdown measurements here as drawdown is just starting to propagate across this fault. Let's pretend that we don't actually know about that fault. Now, how many times do we don't know about a fault? Or if it's not a fault, it'll be some other structural feature, something which interferes with our concepts of what's under the ground. So, we build our model and we don't include the fault because we don't know about it. But we do know because hydrogeologists have told us that we've got steeply dipping aquifers and aquitards here. So in our attempts to replicate what's under the ground, we make aquifers be aquifers and we give them high K and aquitards are aquitards and we give them low K. We put in the steeply dipping beds because that's what the real thing looks like. At least that's the current concept of the real thing. And we have numerical problems because layers get thin and desaturation starts to occur. Saturation thicknesses are thin as these subcropping cells. And we don't do a very good job of history matching because the model's taking a long time to run because our metric here is to make it look like the real thing. And the model's taking a long time to run and it's numerically unstable. And we've put upper and lower bounds on the various hydraulic conductivities here because after all aquifers are aquifers and aquitards are aquitards. And when we try to history match, we don't do a very good job. Perhaps the model can't work with PEST or PEST++ plus plus anymore because it's too numerically delicate. So perhaps we do the worst of all possible things, reduce the level of parameterization complexity and try to calibrate this thing by hand. Now, if you've got a structurally complex model and a simple parameterization scheme, all you've got is a simple model in disguise and a very, very expensive and next to useless simple model. But often, and, and even though, you know, this is just a story, I've seen this happen again and again, the job of history matching just becomes too difficult, either out of the numerical problems of the model or the fact that we've signed up rigidly to a certain geological set of concepts Aquitards are aquitards, and if we can't fit this little bit of drawdown here that's coming from this pumping, we turn a vice into a virtue and we say, oh, well, well that'd be overfitting anyway. I've, but I've respected current prevailing geological concepts. This is a good model. The metric being, it looks like the real thing according to prevailing geological concepts. So what have I achieved here? What I've achieved actually is precisely the opposite of what decision support modelling should achieve. What I've done is locked the gate on data. 
what I've done is hardwired geological concepts which may be wrong and disallowed precious little bits of information from influencing those vitally important little bits of treasure called parameters that could in this case tell me that pumping may in fact affect this river but the small signals have been locked out because of a model that's just not built for data assimilation. Now, I'm not saying that happens every time, but I'm saying this is the big pitfall of excessive model structural complexity. The fact that excessive structural complexity cannot do anything else but hardwiring concepts that may be inadequate, that may be wrong, that may change next time the geological map is drawn, and that blocks out precious, precious information that may be available through the historical behaviour of the system. My experience is unequivocally that calibration always throws up surprises and if we're not ready to be surprised, we're not doing our job properly. So anyway, in terms of our little roadmap here, that's this middle lane here. High levels of structural complexity, high levels of parameterization complexity. Now again, I'm saying it is a spectrum and I'm not saying that you should never be structurally complex, but what I am saying is recognise the pitfalls in going to this end of the spectrum. And there are many and I see them all the time and I see many models that as a result of those pitfalls are not doing a good job they're because they're trying to satisfy the wrong metric. Okay, let's go to this other end of our little spectrum here. Now, again, I'm not saying this is the end that we should always be, but I am saying that there are certain uh, positive things about being at this end, which I'll also illustrate with a, with a story. Now, this, this end of the spectrum is where we say, okay, let's build a model fairly and squarely for history matching purposes. Now, there's got to be a minimum level of structural complexity, of course. We don't want to hardwire in obvious predictive bias. We don't want parameters to have to take on obviously compensatory roles for model inadequacies as the history matching is done. But nevertheless, for reasons we talked about earlier in this webinar, we do sign up to certain levels of abstraction the moment we sign up to decision support modelling for reasons we explained in the last webinar. At least considering this end of the spectrum is a worthy thing and then the onus of proof should be on whether we move along this spectrum in this direction. But starting off here, is, at least conceptually, isn't a bad thing to do. So I call this a little lane of our roadmap, the fit first and ask questions later lane, where we say let's fit the data and see what it tells us. Now what it tells us isn't going to be a picture perfect picture of the subsurface, but by letting the data speak, I might learn some pretty important things that I may not have otherwise learned had I not treated the information and the data that I've got, of which I may have invested a lot of money, as sacred. So this could also be called maybe the data is sacred lane. So. I'm going to illustrate actually with an example that you can all download and read if you want. It's a decision support uh, ground, uh, decision support worked example. And the focus of this model is actually in an area in the Pilbara. And we start this sorry story, uh, but it gets better, with a model that was built a long time ago. Uh, well, not that, about 10, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, I think. And it was built according to that, that purpose that, which I just described at the left-hand end of that spectrum. Here we've got a model that was built paying great respect for current hydrogeological concepts. And it was built for a number of purposes. And that was the trouble. As soon as you build a model for more than a couple of purposes, it's probably going to be too complex to serve any one of those, too structurally complex to serve any one of those. So we've got geology, complicated geology, steeply dipping beds. Some of these beds contain ore. Some of them contain aquifers, some of them contain aquitards. The issue of main concern for this little story is roughly how much has got to be extracted from this aquifer here, 
to keep a mine dry once a mine starts being dug. Now the mine is now in existence but in those days it wasn't and one of the reasons for building this model was to get some idea of what the dewatering requirements would be. So the model had seven layers, again out of respect for prevailing ge hydrogeological concepts which by the way have since changed. But even just a moment's reflection about that is worthy. Seven layers to represent geology this complex, are we going to get the connections right with just a mere seven layers? And anyway, what if there's more to it than just uh, steeply dipping hydro stratigraphy? What if pronounced structural features here have a say in how water moves when you put in a mine or put in a dewatering system to support that mine? Anyway, this model didn't do a very good job of history matching data that really mattered when it came to predicting dewatering requirements for that mine. It took too long to run, it was too complex, it was too unstable, it was unfocused on what it had to do. So as part of the decision of the GMDSI thing, we said let's go back and look at data that was available at the time but which that model was not able to reproduce and hence this model under predicted how much or what the dewatering requirements of the mine would be. So having one purpose firmly in mind, that of gaining some idea what would happen to groundwater once a mine was put in this area here, we went back and we built a simple model. Again the premise is fit first, ask questions later. There was data in 20 wells here, drawdown measured after these six wells were one after another pumped for up to 10 days and very complex drawdowns patterns emerged in these 20 or so observation wells. What's that telling us about the dewatering requirements of the mine? Well let's build a model specifically to ask that question. What is that data telling us? So simple structure, complex parameterization. And using past HP, we were able to fit that data shockingly well uh, over all in, uh, the drawdowns in all the wells, over all the pump tests. And in so doing, patterns like this started to emerge. So this is hydraulic conductivity. Now, I'm not going to say for one moment that this is a picture of what's under the ground. But I am going to say that we learnt a lot from these patterns. Now some of the permeability actually follows the uh, map to hydrostratigraphy, the mapped outcrop of steeply dipping beds. Okay, no surprises there. Some of the low permeability follows the outcrop of impermeable beds, no surprises there. Some crosses them aligned with structural features. Well, a little bit surprised. This is important. Some does come as a surprise. What's that doing there? However, uncertainty analysis told us this is real. Now, not necessarily real in that it exists at this layer of the subsurface. Water flow is still predominantly horizontal here, by the way, but there are is layering. And so what we're seeing here is a bit abstract. Specific yield, similar story. Sometimes we knew that this was aligned with high porosity beds. Sometimes, again, surprises, but the uncertainty analysis said, you've got to believe there's water stored somewhere here to which pumping will have access once pumping begins. And that's the important thing. This picture, we are not saying for one moment we have captured what's under the ground. On the other hand, we've learnt what needs to be learnt. We've learnt that A, when we start pumping here, there are zones of high permeability that are aligned with and cross the prevailing hydrostratigraphy. Two, that permeability is going to connect us with some pretty good sources of water in neighbouring aquifers or perhaps in overlying beds. Three, when we come to predict roughly the dewatering requirements, as we did, we were in the ballpark much closer to what the previous model did because we built this model to assimilate data. 
Now, there was no pretense here about replicating what's under the ground, and in some senses, uh, the details of what's under the ground I don't particularly care about, but I do care about the ramifications of that detail. And this model was able to assimilate the data to allow us to know pretty well the ramifications of what was under the ground for when mining started and dewatering had to commence. So again, here's where we are on our on this lane of our little roadmap, moderate structural complexity and moderate to high parameterization complexity. So in conclusion, the idea that a more complex model is a better model should be abandoned forever. That, but that still, unfortunately, underpins a lot of our thinking about modeling. This is not the right metric. There's not even a metric here. The implicit metric is it looks more like the real thing. Well, that's not our job. Secondly, that whole idea of complexity is more nuanced than what we normally appreciate when we're talking about complexity in groundwater modelling. There is parameter complexity, there is structural, parameter, uh, structural complexity, there is an interplay between them, but the each and their interplay must be chosen focused on the data we have to assimilate or on the fact that there mightn't be data to assimilate in contexts that Catherine talked about, but each one of the contexts we're in, the hydrogeological contexts, and just as importantly, the data assimilation contexts, has repercussions for parameter complexity and structural complexity and how they play together in a decision support model that assimilates data if it's available and quantifies the uncertainties of decision critical model predictions. And Parameters, 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 these are the gold, these are the treasures in our models. We build the model to, to, to facilitate the movement of data and the parameters are the things that receive data when we history match, receive data when we characterize what's under the ground stochastically, pass data onto the prediction and quantify the repercussions of not having enough data. We build the models for the parameters, the job of structure is to provide a host for the parameters. And finally, let's not forget our job description. Our job description is not to build something that is a digital replica of what happens under the ground. Simulation is important, yes. Our, we, our attempts to simulate the processes that operate under the ground are fairly feeble. However, our ability to assimilate and pass data to where it's needed is actually pretty good. And it doesn't depend on picture perfect replication of what happens under the ground. It depends on the ability to simulate the repercussions of what's under the ground to the predictions that we have to make. And that's only going to happen if we design our model with the decision support imperatives firmly in mind from the moment we begin building that model and that that model is able to dance, be numerically stable, reasonably fast running, Simulation on its own does nothing for decision support. Simulation, when done in collaboration with members of the PEST and PEST++ suite, fulfills the decision support imperative of quantifying the uncertainties of decision critical predictions and reducing them. So with that, I'll leave you with our roadmap. Again, what I've hoped here is to introduce uh, there's a lot more to be said about this topic and not enough has been said. What we've hoped to do is introduce some concepts here which I think have been missing so far from this extremely important discussion. To say it's not just all about replicating what's under the ground, it's not just all about the hydrogeological conceptual model, it's about the data we have to assimilate and how best to assimilate it and point it at the decision critical predictions. And perhaps the concepts that are enshrined in this table can take us a little bit further along that road that the concepts that have been operating so far, which in my opinion has taken us more often than not to bad decision support places than good decision support modelling places. And with that, I'll hand back to Rui. Thank you, Rui. Thank you, Rui.